This morning, I am going to talk to you about rhythms of rest. That's our theme. You can see it on the wall back there. Rhythms of rest. So as we start out our conversation about rhythms of rest, I want to talk to us for just a couple minutes about what rest is not. Okay? Rest is not the cessation of all activity. Rest is not laziness. It's not avoiding work. It's not shirking responsibilities. It's not laying around all day. And it's not binge watching your favorite show. Who, who thought that was rest? <laughs> Sometimes we equate rest with doing nothing. And that's not really what rest is. Because have you ever experienced a, an unexpected day off where you absolutely laid around and did nothing all day? Did you feel refreshed the day after? Or did you feel a little groggy? You normally feel a little groggy after that. So that must not be rest because as the Lord talks to us about rest, it's a refreshing, it's a rejuvenating, it's, it's a, a replenishing kind of thing. So those things are not rest. Uh, you cannot not cook all day for your family because you're resting. Okay? That, that, that's just not what rest is about. However, rest is a period of time spent pausing from routine activities. It's pausing for mental, physical, and spiritual regeneration. Sometimes we can rest in, in, in a, like our, over our lunch hour if we're at work. We can take our lunch time and rest because we pause and we rejuvenate. Now that's, you have to have more rest than that, but that's a, a way to rest. Rest is also engaging in activities that are maybe pleasurable to us. There's a slide there, the next slide shows um, people doing things, like there's a dad cooking with his daughter, a family playing games, a little girl reading, someone fishing, someone running, someone um, working on the pottery wheel. Those are all things that could be involved in rest because those are not necessarily the normal daily activities that we would find ourselves engaged in on a regular basis. But they're times away. They're times spent outside of the regular activity for a period of rest. It's interesting to note, if we go to, um, to Genesis 1, Genesis 1 gives us the story of creation, and it, it talks about what God created on each day. It talked about the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day. When he gets to the sixth day, he creates animals, and he creates man. Then God did what? He rested. So God actually worked and then he rested. But we're man. And what was man's first day? It was rest. So man rested and then God put him to work. It must have been an enormous task for Adam to name all, all the animals. I mean, that, that was work. It wasn't IBM or going to the office or crunching numbers in a bank, but it was the work that was assigned to Adam to do. So God set this precedent for mankind that we would rest and then we would work. If you look at... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at it from this perspective, it creates a very interesting twist, and it also um, kind of look, takes a look at our logo that plugging in with the lightning bolt for the S. We have to be plugged in to the rhythms of resting in order to work rather than working to rest. Working to rest 
puts a, a completely different spin. We work, we work, we work, we work, we work, we work, we rest. But resting to work gives us a whole new perspective and it takes it to a whole new dimension. If you take a look at the Jewish Sabbath, Jewish Sabbath on Friday starts at Friday night at sundown. Now we all know that the Sabbath is Saturday for the Jewish people, but their Sabbath begins at sundown. Work ceases at sundown. And then they enter into this day of rest. So what would happen if instead of seeing a day as sun up to sun down, we would begin to see the day starting at dinner? So you would come home and end your day on your way home from work, and then you would begin the next day with family dinner. You would sit down, you would share a meal together, you would guard your evening, you would go to bed and rest, and then you would get up and work. It's just something to think about. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, it's a mandate, but it's very, very different if you start your day in the evening and then you're really more prepared. How many of you lay your clothes out the night before? You know what you're going to wear the next morning. <laughs> you don't have a choice, do you? You just put on a FedEx uniform and go. That's easy. That's why you send your kids to private school so you don't argue about what you're going to wear in the morning. Put your uniform on. It's just simple. But a, a lot of times, depending on our personalities and our organization skills, a lot of times we actually do that without thinking about it. We start preparing for the next day the evening before. If we began to live this as a lifestyle, it's possible that we would see our days differently. When you, when you think about working to rest, it can give you the, it can lead to maybe feeling like you're irreplaceable or indispensable. Oh, I have to work. Oh, I, I have to do this. I, I have to do that. There's nobody else to do it. I, I have to, I can't rest. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. And so you kind of get this, um, Oh, it's kind of a self-gratification from how hard you work or how long you work or a little bit of uh, things depend upon you. But resting to work reinforces the idea that we are totally and completely dependent upon God. We are totally and completely dependent upon God, not only for the work that we're going to do, but for the rest we need to gain the strength to do it. Then it starts to put a different perspective on how we see ourselves and how we see our interactions with others playing out in eternity, not only temporally here on earth, but also in eternity. If God rested, and if God gave Adam his very first day of life as a day of rest, it must be important. It just simply must be. I had someone, um, now I, I, I have to tell you, I'm kind of a self-professed, probably pretty obvious workaholic. So me preaching to you on rest is kind of funny in itself. I mean, it's just kind of cute, I think, for, for me to be up here on the second Sunday of the year talking to you about rest. But I have to tell you, the only reason I allowed them to let me preach this Sunday was because back in September, the Lord started talking to me about this before we knew it was our theme. And the Lord began to talk to me about how out of order my life was. And here's what prompted that conversation with the Lord. Someone said to me, you know, we would never disobey the Ten Commandments. But we violate Sabbath all the time. 
And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, you crazy woman. You know, you are lazy, you are, you know. I just, I just had this immediate response when it was spoken into the context that it was spoken into. And then I, I went and I started to pray and the Lord said to me, well, would you commit adultery? I said, oh, absolutely not. Would you steal? Oh, absolutely not. Would you? No, 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 I wouldn't do that. Will you take a day off? I think 9 out of 10. That's 90%. That's still an A in most schools. You know, I know they raise it to 94% in some schools, but, you know, that's still a B plus. And on a scale of, you know, life, B plus, that's good, right? That's good. But then the Lord began to say to me, why, why won't you rest? Why, why won't you follow this command of mine? And you begin to find when you're a very active or very productive or whatever word you want to use for working as much as we all work, whatever word you want to fill in with that, when you start to think about taking a day of rest or taking a day to stop some of the normal activities as I described it, you can probably only imagine the guilt that overwhelms you for just doing nothing. Now, where does guilt come from, generally speaking? Generally speaking, it's the enemy playing with us. Because God doesn't make us feel guilty. God convicts us of sin. It's a completely different feeling, and it's a completely different root. Because conviction drives me to repent. Guilt just drives me to wallow and to go down a mental rabbit trail that is very, very destructive. So the Lord dealt with me from sort of beginning in August, but it really, really, really hit home in September. And so I've, I'm, I'm, preaching, you from, I'm preaching to you from the perspective of trying. Is that okay? Because sometimes we preach from victory Sometimes we preach from, from the truth of the word. And sometimes we have to preach from, from the human frailty point of, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm walking this through. I'm learning this. And I'm probably not going to do it perfectly. But I am going to keep trying. So there are days when I don't do anything. And I, I kind of like it. I really, I kind of like it. It's after the waves of guilt, you know, after the waves of guilt left and I started, you know, just reading the word and doing a little more study and thinking it through and letting the Lord talk to me, I realized that, that I, I really kind of like it and I'm actually a lot more productive. I'm a lot more productive in six days than I was in seven. Now, it's an interesting thing because even in the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of this, of the, uh, it's not this century anymore, that shows my age, I guess. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution came and plant managers began to realize that their machines were more efficient if they didn't run them seven days a week. But if they gave them a day to rest... They gave them a day to recalibrate. They gave them a time for maintenance and repair. And then they could run them hard for six days as long as they let them stop and cease their activity on that seventh day. It's funny that people who are not Christians embrace Christian principles and they work. I, I know a number of pretty wealthy, like multi-million dollar businessmen 
who tithe not only their personal income, but the proceeds of their company. And when they were asked, why do you tithe? You don't even, you know, you don't even go to church. You, you would say that you're a non-believer. They said, oh, it doesn't matter whether we believe or not. It works. It, it works. And I just sat there thinking, you're kidding me, right? Like, we can't even people who believe in Jesus to tithe, you know? And you guys know it works, and you don't even believe. But they just embrace the philosophy because they, it's a principle that works. The same principle of rest worked. It worked for, for people in industry, and it will more so work for those of us who follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who created us and gave us the ability to rest. Rest keeps our life in perspective. It keeps us from being distracted from our dependency on God. And busyness, and the contrary, as I've already said, can lead to self-sufficiency and an exaggerated sense of self-importance. So, I'm done. The sermon is over, and I'm just going to leave you with this challenge. Where are you personally in, in the God-ordained rhythms of rest? Where are you? That You can just think about that for a minute. And then the next question is, where do you want to be? Or where should you be? Or where do you want to be in these sacred rhythms? Because there are, there are sacred rhythms in the kingdom, and rest is one of those sacred rhythms, along with Bible reading, uh, something called Lectio Divina, which is an intense, intense, uh, in-depth conversation with God about a scripture or a few scriptures and and what they mean to your person what God is saying to you personally through that there's fasting there's prayer there's worship there's all these all these uh, spiritual disciplines that create a sacred rhythm to our life and rest is one of those so where where should you or would you like to be in that sacred rhythm and then think about what are three things that you can do to move into that sacred rhythm of rest that God has designed for us. Because if we don't enter into the sacred rhythms of rest, we will not have the energy to accomplish the things God has called us to do. And I, I don't know about I don't know about you, I, I don't know how other people feel about this, but I get pretty excited to think that before I was born, God planned certain things that only I could do. That, that makes me, um, it, it gives me a constant reminder of how important I am to God. How I'm not just, he saved the whole world, oh yeah, and you too, Sharon. You know, I'm not a you too. I, I'm not a you too. I'm a, I saved Sharon, little Sharon Krosky, who would become Sharon Snow, who would marry Art Snow and would move on and would accomplish these things for my kingdom that, was, that is going to prepare her for the things I've going, I'm going to ask her to do once she joins me in eternity. Because, you know, when they do that thing at funerals and they go, he has entered into his eternal rest. They didn't read that part about ruling and reigning throughout all of eternity. I think that's going to be work. I, I think we're going to work. I don't know what we're going to rule and reign, but we're going to rule and reign something. And the queen seems awfully busy, you know. <laughs> Prince William and Kate, they seem awfully busy, so there's got to be work to ruling and reigning if that's some semblance of our example. So we have to get this rhythm down and we have to be all that we can be. We have to be the best we can be so that nothing God has assigned to us goes unaccomplished. The saddest thing for me, and I, I know this is probably never going to happen, but you know, people write these books that tug on your heartstrings and make you do things that you, know, you wouldn't normally do. That I, I read a book once where the guy stands before God and the whole premise of the book is he always 
he, he always wanted to choose God, but he just, he was always so consumed with his flesh that he could never quite get there. And when he got to heaven, there was this panorama movie, if you will, this view of all the things God had planned for him to do that God had to let go undone. And some things that he had to ask other people to, to take on as extra tasks because he wouldn't move in those things. And I no, I don't think that's really going to happen to us. I really don't. But it made me think, what when I stand before God, what do I want from him? What do I want to receive from the Lord when I stand before him? And it is definitely well done, good and faithful servant. It is not... You made it, you little slacker. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're in by the skin of your teeth. I don't want that response. If heaven is a stadium, I want a, I want a loge. I don't want the cheap seats. You know, I, that's just how, <laughs> I know. It's how I, it's how I view life. I want to give my best to the master. And in order to do that, I have to take care of the vehicle that he gave me to live in until I get a new one. Amen? Amen. Enjoy rest this week. God bless you.